Greetings, this is Jan Spencer here in Eugene, Oregon, and my good friend Ole Erson just up the road in mm -hmm. Portland. And we're having a little bit of a conversation. I've seen Ole uh, make presentations before. I've been to Kyle Ash Eco Village two or three times. One of my favorite stories about transformation, repairing the urban landscape and creating social cohesion. Uh, it's just one of the best stories I know. So here we are with Ole, and we're going to have kind of a little bit of an informal conversation. I've got some questions for him here that he's looking at right now. This is not a presentation. It's more of a conversation. So uh, with that said, Ole, there we go. Motivation. What's motivated mm -hmm. you? Pick up where you left off uh, a little bit earlier. Yeah, sure. So uh, I grew up in Corvallis, about 80 miles south of Portland, you know, midway between Portland and Eugene, where you live, on a farm. And um, I was gardening, you know, the, we had the family on the family farm, we had gardens and, you know, animals and forest and, and orchards and stuff like that. And so from an early age, I really enjoyed that. And have always wanted to uh, participate in those kind of activities. Uh, so when we, when my wife Maitri and I moved to Portland in 1990, uh, I was headed to medical school uh, at uh, in local medical school, OHSU, Oregon Health Health and Sciences University, and <clears throat> we were looking for a place to stay. This is the summer before classes start. We were looking for a place to stay, and. Uh, we knew where our son was, our son was five years old, going to enter kindergarten. So we were scouting out housing in the, the neighborhood. And right across from the school was this boarded up old house, uh, boarded up derelict old house. So we contacted, we, you know, you can look at the, the public records, who owns this property and what's going on with it. So we researched it. And found out that it was part of a um, the estate of this woman who had died. Uh, her attorney had sold the property to um, a halfway house organization, halfway between prison and society. And uh, so it was a halfway house, essentially. Uh, and what happened is the halfway house failed as many new businesses do, uh, you know, the, starting a business is really hard. So this halfway house failed and it ended up the attorney, the estate foreclosed on the property and it was boarded up. And our timing was perfect and fortuitous. The attorney says, uh, yeah, we foreclosed on the property. It's for sale. We haven't listed it yet. It's for sale. Are you interested? And we said, yeah, yes, we're interested. It's right across from our son's school. So, um, and I had done, you know, fix up work before in the past, uh, an, an earlier project, my wife, Maitri and I had fixed up an old church that we bought at a county auction <laughs> in Sio, Oregon, near, uh, south of, south, southeast of Salem. And we spent a couple of years turning this basically just a shell, uh, that was of a, this church that was built in the 1880s and had also been abandoned and the county was wow. selling it at auction so we had a we had experience we did for two years we basically remodeled this property uh put in a septic system and a toilet when we first started out we uh were just pooping in a bucket uh, out of necessity <laughs> you know it was not our ideal to do human or composting but uh we did that and i mean i've i've been composting since i was a kid so uh and, you know, you can compost animal manure, so why not human manure? So we did that, and it worked out great. Um, and then we sold that property and moved on. Uh, it moved back to Massachusetts for a couple of years, and then I decided to go to medical school. So we moved out, and then basically we restarted a, this new project. And I'll tell you some of the figures. So the, the attorney says this property, is, he wants twenty two five for it because it's in pretty poor shape. And uh, so we said, yeah, well, I think we can 
figure that. My parents helped us out. And so we moved in. Uh, there was only one toilet, flush toilet, and the house was a mess. And the the uh, there was vomit on the walls, and I mean it was a really terrible mess. That the halfway house had not been kind <laughs> to the property. Uh, so we started this remodeling project, and then we turned it into this beautiful, beautiful uh, neighborhood destination. Uh, flowers outside. Maitri loves flowers, so any passersby would walk by, and the place is totally in bloom. The front yard. And we're right across from the school, so it's a high traffic area. All the people are coming to pick up their kids. Oh, like how much time elapsed between buying it and moving in, and all the flowers? Yeah, so uh, it was it was late summer, nineteen ninety. Medical school starting in September, and we moved in, and we're basically camping out inside because the place was so run down. And that's what you got to be prepared for when you undertake some of these projects is uh, sometimes you just have to camp out and then pull yourself up by your bootstraps. So that's what that's the story of our life over the next couple of decades. We would finish a project and then move on to another and use the um, the equity we built up in the first project to uh, go on to the next project. And that's, you know, we when I when we started, I had no assets. I mean, I didn't have any money. Our family was fairly poor. Uh, so we started out with this one house and, uh, you know, we bought it for 22000 And then 13 years later, um, we were able to sell it for 300000 uh. The The neighborhood, the, the, this neighborhood in Southeast Portland was appreciating 25% a year, year after year for like 13 years. So, uh, I mean, it was reasonably priced. It wasn't uh, you know, exorbitantly priced or anything. This was the going price, three hundred thousand. It's probably now five, six hundred thousand, because Portland continues to appreciate. But anyway, so that gave us funds, and then we did a couple more projects. Uh, and each time, we would uh, take a a neglected, not necessarily rundown, but a neglected project, a vanilla project with just grass and shrubs and turn it into kind of a garden, you know, beautiful gardens and flowers and all. You asked how much time did it take? Uh, probably it was, Mike, do you remember how long be, between when we purchased uh, 18, the 18th Avenue property and the time that it was all covered with flowers in the front yard? A couple, couple years, yeah, a couple years. Like those, like our project in Shelburne where we bought the church, it took us a couple of years. Uh, and then we moved out uh, and it, that was in a rural area. And one of the lessons I learned is I didn't want to be in a rural area. You're so isolated. Uh, it was a 40 minute drive to uh, 20 minutes to the county seat, Albany, and then 40 minutes to Corvallis, which is where I grew up and where my parents lived. And I had family there and we did shopping there and stuff like that. So we were, you know, commuting once a week, probably. Um and doing a lot of driving. Uh, and I decided we, I mean, we both decided we never wanted to do that again. So that was the end of our sort of rural uh, utopia vision. And uh, we decided we would be in an, in a, in an urban area for, for future projects. Uh, and we had, pro we had fun doing all these projects. We had gardens and, uh, you know, you did human or composting and all that kind of stuff. Um, at the same time, then I was working full time fixing up this place. Uh, but in now I'm in medical school, so I'm still putting in a lot of time because we're camping out. We're trying to fix up the place. It took us a couple of years to fix up the place and, you know, get the place painted and then really nice looking. Uh, and then we enjoyed the property for another 10 years until we eventually sold it. Our kids were getting old and we wanted to move on. Um, and then so. We were, we had, had, our story was we'd done successions of houses, one after the other. After we sold that place, we ended up near People's Co-op where we did another project. It was a kind of a rundown project in a, this time in an industrial area. We were right across the street from the Amtrak line, the, the main freight line. 
So when the trains would come by, the, the house would go, almost shake, uh. but it was right in the industrial area. We did the same there. It was a uh, oversized lot in this industrial area, uh, but it was a residential use. Uh, and so we, we moved in and did the same thing there. Uh, and each time we were increasing our equity uh, to the point where we finally realized, uh, hey, it's fun to do projects on your own, but why not incorporate community into the project? So you're living, the goal is you're living with other people and sharing a vision. And of course, as a community, you can uh, accomplish so much more because you have you know 20 people or 50 people or whatever. Uh, so you can multiply your efforts and your impact by taking that next step to community. Uh, and of course, community has all kinds of other advantages, like you can share things, you know, instead of uh, 10 households, each one having a lawnmower or a rototiller or something like that. You only need one for 10 households or the equivalent number of people. Uh, so, you know, it's common sense, but uh, it's a frugal way of living in community. In community, you can actually live very frugally low resource, low carbon expenditure, low carbon footprint uh, by living in community. So there's so many advantages. And of course, we had decided we wanted to stay in an urban area where uh, putting a project together like this really makes sense because you have this immediate several hundred thousand people. And among those people, you're going to find people who are interested in doing what you're doing. If you're out in the country, you're not going to be able to attract uh, participants to share in a project. And of course, multifamily projects are not available in the country anyway. The zoning does not, does not allow multifamily out in the countryside. So uh, the only way really to do a co-housing or a community type project is in a, a rural area, at least in Oregon. Now in many, in some other states, maybe you can with, I mean, Texas doesn't be, there are places where there's no zoning, you know, many, many places in the country where there's no zoning, you can do whatever you want, put up a multifamily, uh, have multiple families living on a property in the middle of nowhere, but generally zoning restricts that to city areas. So yet another reason to do do these projects in, uh, in, the, in the urban area. So uh, we explored co-housing and we actually joined the Coho co-housing project in Corvallis. We were members for a couple of years while the community was planning its infrastructure, uh, designing the buildings and all of that. Uh, and we realized uh, after a year or two, as much as we enjoyed the process with the, with the people there and the people at that, this co-housing were fantastic people, really, really great people that you love to live with, people with vision and people who were doing all kinds of interesting things. But we didn't want to move to Corvallis. So that that, that was the reason we dropped out of Coho. Uh, but we still wanted to do a community. We just realized Corvallis, the Coho wasn't going to work for us because it was in Corvallis and we really wanted to stay in Portland. So then we started looking in Portland uh, for communities and we explored that for a while and uh eventually we teamed up with joe and pam leach are you familiar with them no the I'm leeches not, they had they had been running the portland permaculture they created and were running the portland permaculture institute and they had bought mm -hmm. this one acre farmhouse on killingsworth in northeast portland and in front of the farmhouse there was this uh, 35 unit apartment complex and Joe and Pam had also explored co-housing and were interested in community projects in the past. So it was a perfect marriage. The two, the two couples, Maitri and I and Joe and Pam, got together and initiated this project that eventually became Columbia Co-Housing. Mm -hmm. In the process, we worked with them. We were meeting weekly for, uh, I don't know, a year or so. We eventually realized that uh, our vision that included human manure was not going to work at Columbia co-housing because that that is uh kind of stretching uh stretching boundaries you know it's a little bit too much outside the box for most people and 
let's face it, co-housing communities, uh, their audience is generally a well-moneyed, you've got to, you know, you've got to have assets to join this co-housing because it's a condominium model. Mm -hmm. And the cheapest oh. units are in the multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that's how it was at uh, Columbia Co-Housing. When they finally got the project uh, moving and moving forward. We had dropped out at that point. They moved forward, got a builder and a contractor and all that. Their studio units were 160,000. Uh, and this was back in about 2007, 2008. Uh, so the only way you're going to attract uh, people is, you know, money. You kind of, it's pejorative, but yuppies, so to speak. And, um, and, that that was a, that was another uh, thing that we were concerned is that a lot of people who are moneyed uh, and able to buy in and of course this is an egalitarian structure everybody has a single an equal vote you know you you have a vote one vote per unit for the organizational and decision making process and then the common areas are owned in common and are managed by the community so you've got to get uh, buy in from the membership to do anything. And something as radical as human newer composting, we figured would be a stretch for a co-housing. So that's why we decided we were going to do something on our own. So we were living in Southeast Portland at that time. And uh, I was commuting to work at that time. I was a doctor working for the county. So I would commute by bike and bus to my workplace. And one one area that uh, that I passed by every day on my way home to, from work uh, I discovered this apartment building that was for sale, um, and that was Kailash. Uh, it was a you know 32 unit apartment building. It was run down. I mean, it wasn't particularly run down from the outside, but when you started checking into the details, yeah, there were a bunch of vacant units. I think there were six vacant units, uh, which is you know out of 32 units, not quite a quarter, but close to a quarter of the units, and they were vacant because they were unlivable. You know, there was no toilet or there was no stove. You know, you have to have hot and cold running water and uh, thermostatic controlled heating and all this stuff in order for the county health department to not cite you for trying to illegally rent out, you know, places. You know, there's minimum uh, public health standards. Mm. Uh, so uh, we figured, hey, let's go ahead and try this out. Uh, we have the finances. It was quite a stretch because banks are very very conservative so this property was 1.7 million uh and they wanted 30 percent down uh they wanted five hundred and fifty thousand dollars down so it was really a struggle for us we had to mortgage our, several of our properties plus we had to come up with a ton of cash uh but we were able to do it uh and so we put five hundred thousand dollars down on this 1.7 million dollar property i was working uh, as a physician for the county health department. So I had a regular income. And that's probably one of the reasons that the bank uh, felt that we could pull it off because we, you know, for for banks, the key is cash flow. Are you going to be able to make the payment to the bank? That's all they care about. Uh, I mean, that's kind of a little bit of an exaggeration, but banks want to make sure that you can pay the mortgage. Uh, and insurance and property tax and all those other things. So you create a pro forma of pro your projected expenses and uh, your income and all of that. And you try and persuade the bank, yeah, this is a uh, going to be a successful business project. Now, keep in mind, of 100 businesses that start, uh, in a couple of years, 90% have failed. So banks are quite aware that there's high failure rate that's why they're so conservative um but with this high down payment they they felt like you're not just going to walk away from the the property if you do we'll we'll be able to turn it around and sell it to somebody else anyway uh we finagled this deal with uh at that point it was one pacific bank and we the reason we approached them is because they had a reputation for supporting uh yeah, uh, pioneering projects, green projects, and community projects. They or they bankrolled Columbia Co-housing or Columbia Columbia Echo Village, 
uh, and a couple of other of the co-housing projects in Portland that were starting out. So they had a reputation and they were interested in our project because we were taking over this rundown building. We're going to turn it into a, you know, a green development. So it's, you know, right up their line. Um, and so we launched into the project. Uh, that, I hope that gives a sense of the motivation. So that kind of to re recapitulate, we had been doing our kind of little paradise at, at, on single family development, single family properties, uh, serially, one after the other. Uh, and we had gotten pretty good at doing that and camping out when you had to, you know, because oftentimes when you move into a derelict property, you got to camp out and then you fix it up. And the cool thing with owner occupied properties is you can do most of the work yourself. So I learned how to do all this work. Um, electrical and plumbing and, you know, landscaping and all of that stuff, site plans and, you know, all that developmental stuff. Um, so I hope that gives a sense of the motivation that we were doing these uh, really gratifying uh, green type projects over and over again, but as a single family, just, you know, single family. So, uh, our vision was to take the next step into community. And that's what led us to, to start out with this Kailash Eco Village project. Uh, so we started out and, uh, you know, <laughs> this is obviously a huge enterprise. Now you are a landlord for 32 units. Ole, and was there anybody yes. living, was there anybody living in Ole when, uh, in, in uh, the apartment complex when you bought it? Oh yeah. Yeah, so it was, uh, except for six units, the 32 uh, units were okay. fully occupied. Yeah. So you had and a little bit were, of income. You, know, you had a little bit of income when you when you started out. Exactly right. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it wasn't a lot. Uh, and actually, our rents have always been. We've kept our rents below market value, so we don't have a problem filling them up quickly. Our our vacancy rate is really low. But yeah, that gives you the cash flow now to pay your mortgage. And now you can start bootstrapping yourself, gradually fixing up units. And uh, as people move, as the current residents move out, who maybe are, don't share your interest, you try and attract residents in who share your vision for gardening and doing stuff on site that the residents who lived here when we started out had no interest in doing. I mean, most apartment dwellers <laughs> have no interest in gardening. Uh, they're too busy with their lives and um, jobs and all that stuff. So they don't want, that's the last thing they want is to have to grow their own food and, uh, you know, to undertake all these chores and who wants to poop in a bucket and carry it to a, an outdoor <laughs> composting area, you know? So uh, anyway, what we, when we started out, we were attracting people, but yet we still had the original residents. There were prostitutes, there was drug dealing, uh, there was a guy who said, I have never recycled. I'm never going to recycle, you know, because we had instituted this new requirement that people need to start recycling. Uh -huh. now. Uh, and so you get resistance. Uh -huh. uh, and then that guy eventually moved out several months later because he saw the writing on the wall. He wasn't going to be able to stick around forever if he was not, you know, be, be agreeable to the direction that we were going. Uh, anyway, we gradually over the years got residents who really shared our vision, but there were a lot of stumbles. Um, within the first couple of years, we had multiple crises. There was one mental health crisis. A guy went manic and totally disrupted the apartment building with his uh, noise. He would put his speakers right outside his door and blast at loud, loud levels. Uh, and he would walk up and down the balcony, banging the balcony with a plastic baseball bat. Anyway, it, it, so there were crises. Uh, but we, so when you undertake a project like this, you have to have thick skin because things are not going to go uh, smoothly all the time. I mean, most of the time they don't go smoothly, in <laughs> fact. But you just have to persist and hang in there. Uh, and you solve one problem after another. Uh, Richard, who was this guy who went manic and was so totally disruptive, the police were here several times a day. The ambulances were here several times a day because 
He was threatening suicide and he was threatening violence to others. Anyway, um, he was a bump in the road, as there were many other bumps in the road. Uh, but you work on it and you solve the problems and you move on and things get better and better. I mean, hey, when you're uh, when you've got a solid vision, you know, things are going to be get, be getting better all the time. You know, you've solved all these problems over and over in the past. You know, you can do it again. So you have this sort of fundamental optimism that uh, allows you to move forward and mm. Uh, surpass the hurdles as they come up. And there will be many, many hurdles. Anyway, financially, it went okay. Uh, we, we, As I mentioned, uh, I grew up in a very frugal family. My parents were product of the Depression. And so um, from a from very young age, uh, I've minimized my needs for gratification. And that allows you to live more efficiently. So we were able to, to pay down the mortgage more rapidly than we expected and accumulate equity. Uh, and that brings us to the next step, which was Annapurna. So uh, we didn't have a lot of money to do this. I mean, this Annapurna was a $7 million project or something like that. It was seven, seven million, seven point five million, and something us, like that. Tell us, Ole, where is Annapurna located? Okay, so... Annapurna is right next to us, not right next to us, Kailash, Kailash Eco Village, where we had been living for, what, 16 years. We're now on our 17th year. This project started a year ago. And uh, the reason we first contacted that property is because they had one of their trees. They had this big, gigantic cherry tree leaning over their fence right over our building. And so we wanted to prune this tree so it would no longer pose a risk of falling on the building and knocking out the corner of the building. Uh, so it took us eventually two years to enable us to get in touch with the property owner. Finally, he calls us back out of the blue and he says, yeah, I'm happy to, to um, split the cost of uh, removing that tree or pruning it. So it's no longer a, uh, a liability for you. And Hey, by the way, I'm interested in selling the property. Are you interested? So, uh, and then things really moved fast at that point. He listed the property with a local firm that deals with apartment buildings. Uh, and of course, they this company that does that has this big, big mailing list of uh, hundreds of, or thousands of people who are interested in doing uh, multifamily properties as an investment strategy. It's kind of like stock market, but they do re they're into real estate instead of stock markets. So oftentimes you have these absentee investors or groups of investors who have some cash and they want to put it in a, put that in as a down payment and leverage their money and make money. You know, it's capitalism in action. Um, and uh, so we were competing against all of these institutional and private investors who were, you know, in it to make money. Uh, the thing that we had going for us, actually, in a sense, is the property was in severe crisis. So uh, I've gone over this before, but just in a nutshell, there were 35 units out of 53. It was a 53 unit property on two acres next door to us, five buildings. Uh, and uh, 35 of the 53 units were occupied by squatters, unoccupied uh, residents who didn't really have a contract. What had happened is during the pandemic, people, you know, it was a it was a chaotic situation where people had no income, and so they were allowed to to not pay rent for a while, and then they got behind in their rent, and uh, it sort of snowballed, and then it, it ended up in this situation where. Uh, the place just kind of fell apart. Also, the guy who was managing, the owner, uh, was totally derelict in his duties and mm -hmm. not doing the, you know, the obvious due diligence that any business owner has to do to keep a property afloat. Um, so that management had been missing in action for a couple of years, and that led to this really squalid, rundown, crime-ridden uh, property with... Uh, the police were called all the time. There were shootings. There was an overdose death. Um, it was rampant crime. Uh, when you're when a lot of these squatters, when they're they're 
electric meter was cut off, they would simply steal the neighbor's electric meter and switch it with theirs. And then they'd have another month or two before the power company figured out what was going on. Uh, and this was happening, you know, I mean, this, this stuff that was going on there, uh, oh, yes. it, it was like an unbelievable, the, the realtor said they had never seen a property like this. So what happened with the, the sale and the deal that was going on is uh, we were outbid by another investor group. Oh. And so they had 30 days to inspect the property and verify that it met their needs. And during their uh, due diligence research, they discovered what a chaotic situation it was. And then, of course, they dropped out. And at that point, the owner and the, the broker, real estate brokers, realized they had to be very upfront with any future potential buyer so that, you know, that it wasn't a waste of everybody's time. You know, they didn't want to go through this again. But that worked to our advantage because we we were sort of in the driver's seat because uh, we were the only ones who were willing to, <laughs> to undertake to, to launch into a property like this. I mean, it's a it was a gutsy proposition. Uh, we figured it could we could spend one hundred fifty thousand dollars resolving the illegal occupancies there. So, yeah, in our pro forma, we budgeted one hundred fifty thousand dollars legal expenses to take care of all these you know property uh, people who were squatting. Basically, Portland has very very progressive. Uh, renter friendly uh, legal framework here, and to for somebody to move out, you have to you give them an enormous relocation fee up to forty five hundred dollars wow. to cause them, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. to basically buy them out to cash them out. Anyway, uh, our son in law Caleb, who is our property manager, has amazing people skills. Met all of the people who were living there, and negotiated with them all he signed up many of the uh unauthorized occupants uh he gave them contracts a few bad apples uh we decided no we don't want these people you know the criminal element the people with the pit bulls who were letting their dogs bite other people and attack other animals and the people who were bringing stolen vehicles in every day we didn't want that element to stay uh so in the end uh, he was able to negotiate with uh, all of the folks who were living there. And of course, many of the units actually were uninhabitable. I think 13 units were uninhabitable. And like, uh, I mean, the, the toilets were missing. The kitchen was deconstructed. The breaker panel had all the breakers move, uh, stolen because they were stolen by neighbors to fix the bre their own breaker panel. I mean, it was a very chaotic situation. Mm, wow. uh, but so many, many people were just camping out. We had, you know, all kinds of criminal element camping out in the place. This was like the local crash pad for Southeast Portland. Anyway, Caleb was able to, with his people skills, uh, negotiate with everybody. And we ended up uh, with new tenants, uh, some from the existing people who were living there, but were not authorized, uh, as well as eventually we brought in, we had to remodel, of course, all the, the units uh, that were unlivable. But within a year of us undertaking the project, we had full occupancy uh, and we only spent five less than $500 for legal expenses uh, because we were able to negotiate an amicable exit for people who didn't want to stay or we didn't want to stay. Uh, and people who did want to stay uh, and were willing to follow the rules. So uh, I, Maitri and I would not have been able to do this project on our own the way we started Kailash. When we, when we started Kailash, we were doing everything alone. We, we were interviewing uh, prospective residents and doing, uh, you know, the uh, rental contracts and all that stuff, all the landlord stuff. So Caleb is taking all this responsibility now. Plus, we we got a million dollars because we needed to remodel the place. It was in such bad shape. So we asked the bank for an additional million, one point two million dollars. With that, we were able to uh, paint all the buildings, uh, get all the electrical system working. I mean, that was a huge undertaking because the so many electrical panels and meters were stolen and all those sorts of things going on. We were able to resolve all these issues uh, and. 
get it to a safe uh, and fully occupied level within a year. So that's a tribute to Caleb's skills uh, to pull that off. Maitre and I would not have been able to do that, uh, even though we're both retired and could have spent all our time doing that if we'd wanted to. Um, one of the first things we did, I, I should mention at Kailash, it took us 13 years, but we finally installed gates at the entrance because people, random people were coming in and we would have thefts and bicycle parts and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we did at Annapurna is, was we gated the property, uh, gated and fenced the property. Um, so we've learned some lessons uh, from uh, Kailash. So we were able to... Uh, move way, way faster with Annapurna and, of course, with the assistance of a full-time property manager than we did at, at Kailash. Uh, but again, it was another uh, heroic effort to uh, revitalize this really derelict and neglected and rundown property. And uh, you're not going to find many properties that were in this bad shape but there are hundreds of thousands of apartment buildings around the country that, uh, you know, they're just kind of uh, on the line. They're, they're existing, but they're not inspiring. They're not really great places to live necessarily. Uh, they're just waiting for a spark uh, and somebody to, to undertake a project and turn a vanilla apartment building into kind of an oasis, a green oasis. So that's our vision is to, to do that. Uh, we've done it twice now. Of course, we, I mean, we're just beginning. We're only one year into the Annapurna project, uh, but we've made great progress. Uh, the buildings are all painted and they look great now. All of the trash, I mean, the place was just covered with trash at the beginning. All the trash is cleaned up and things are running smoothly. People are paying rent, uh, which means the project is financially uh, solvent and uh, doable, and it you know has the promise that it's it's a sustainable business. I mean that's the bottom line is it's a sustainable business. Um, and we've had the experience of Kailash, so we know the challenges. So far, the challenges have been uh, equal or greater to what the challenges were for Kailash, but in a different sense. I mean, we haven't had the mental health crises that we had with Kailash. Uh, there, of course, Annapurna had its own prostituting and drug dealing and uh, you know that sort of stuff, unsavory activities going on, vehicle thefts and stuff like that. Um, but uh, we were pretty quickly able to resolve those issues. Now we're in this point where we're trying to go to the next level and plan out the future where we're going to replace lawns with gardens uh, and fruit trees and, you know, rainwater projects and solar projects and other energy projects. One, one of the residents there really wants to do wind power, and he's been investigating these vertical axis windmills. Um, so this is kind of the phase two it's going to be a much longer phase. We phase one was just get the place back on a firm financial footing. Uh, so it's financially sustainable. I mean, you can't be pouring money into these things for very long before the project's not going to be able to pencil out. So all um, so all that's, I, that's where we are now. Yeah. You applied what you learned at Kailash and applied that to Annapurna. You, um, you didn't have to go quite as deep into the realm of making mistakes or having problems that took a long time to solve. But just give us a little bit of a description of the vision. We've talked about the vision. I know what Kyle Ash looks like and what the future is going to look more like at Annapurna. But just Tell us a little bit more about, you bought the property next door, there's gardens, there's a big tree house, you have all these uh, uh, committees for doing work. It's not just there's a little garden place out front and, and the units are livable. You've done so much more than that, you know, to turn this into, like you say, an oasis. Tell us a little bit more of what that oasis looks like. Yeah. 
so let's focus on the social activity. I mean, of course, uh, the whole point of living in community is to uh, have relationships with all of your neighbors. Uh, I mean, I, I've lived in apartment buildings before where I didn't even know my next door neighbor. And when I tried to meet them, they were afraid to even answer the door because they weren't expecting a visitor. So <clears throat> Kailash is just the opposite of that. Everybody knows everybody. We meet each other in the gardens. We meet each other on our email list. We have a, a listserv where there's probably 20, 20, maybe 30 emails a day uh, between community members. What projects are going on? What, you know, what's going on in the gardens? What is the, the updates in the, the different sustainable projects? We we have multiple pro multiple garden projects. There's a group garden project, there's individual plot gardens where you uh, grow your own stuff in your little tiny area of land. Contrast that with the group garden where the gardens are grown communally with 20, 30 people. And uh, you can, do, of course, you can undertake much more ambitious uh, gardening plans when you have a community like that. And we're, we're particularly lucky because we have Neil Robinson who lives with us here. He is a, a professional farmer, veganic uh, farmer, uh, who sells his produce at people's farmers market every week. Uh, and he leads the, he's one of the leaders of the group gardens project. And he's able to sell a lot of our surplus produce at the weekly farmers market. He gets half of the receipts and the group gardens gets half of the receipts. So at the end of the year, each group garden share gets like four or 500 bucks from receipts, uh, from the uh, from income from the year from group car from the farmers market. Uh, I mean, so you worked a lot. You work I don't know two three hours uh, a week through the garden season, but you at the end of the year you get this big bonus. I mean, it's quite amazing. Uh, plus, we supply the community with food. Uh, we have neighbors who are participating in our gardens uh, now. Kailash. Uh, we're prioritizing uh, the Annapurna neighbors to join group gardens rather than the rest of the neighborhood. I mean, we do have some neighbors uh, in the general neighborhood, but our priority is reaching out to the folks at Annapurna to get them on board so they see what's going on and what the future of Annapurna could be like. Uh, but we've been living here for 17 years now. And so in 17 years, you can do a lot of projects, rainwater projects, uh, green energy product projects like solar energy, uh, rainwater gardens, you can take it really to the next level because, yeah, I mean, it's your it's your home. You're trying to constantly do improvements and you get to do it with your neighbors. So it's inspiring to work with your neighbors. We meet each other in the gardens and in our uh, in the landscape, in the gathering areas around. Um, we inspire each other. Uh, people share their political stuff, their political journeys, and their explorations of green uh, living, whatever it means to them. Um, so it's really a wonderful place to live, uh, knowing everybody, having so many kind of close friendships. Uh, and I should say, we're kind of an incubator, too, for Echo Villages. One of our residents, Elliot, was just here Last week, he stayed for a few days and he shared what he's doing in Madison, Wisconsin. So uh, <laughs> he started like, his own little echo village. He bought a triplex uh, in downtown Madison uh, and he's been working on creating an echo village there wow. based on sort of the things that he's learned here. We've had several people, uh, either groups of residents here or couples that have stayed here for several years, been inspired, and they want to go off and start their own project. So there have been probably a half a dozen projects, maybe more. Uh, one guy moved to Texas and started a project. A uh, couple here bought a uh, home in Montevilla, which is a uh, neighborhood a couple miles away, and started their own Echo Village project there. A group here, several households, were very close friends, and uh, moved in together in a big house uh, and started a, a, a project of group, their own group living. So uh, 
we're not just a great place to live uh, forever, if you want. I mean, I don't plan on moving here from here ever again. And we have many people here who have no intention of living. But we have a lot of young people who are coming in uh, and they may want to do some pro big projects in their on their own uh, in the future. And they're not going to stay here forever. I mean, they're young. They want to try try their own projects out. But we have some a lot of retirees here who have no plans to move anywhere else. Mm. They're just enjoying the the beautiful place to live. Uh, it's a it's a most inspiring place to live, to know your neighbors and to have all these friendships and share activities, uh, TV nights and uh, going out to events together, going to the bar together or whatever. You know, so so many things can uh, happen uh, in a neighborhood that enriches your life. And here we have it right here in our own little Eden. Yeah, yeah. And of course, one of the your favorite projects that, that I like so much is you took out what it was a 20 car parking lot and, and you built your beautiful Mandela garden. You did an intersection repair project out front. You reach out to the neighborhood with your emergency preparedness and ham radio. It's not just, you have this cool little place. You have uh, outreach into the nearby neighborhood too. You make the nearby neighborhood a better place. Yeah, many people like one of our guys is uh, very, very active in the emergency preparedness uh, network in Portland. Uh, I mean, he's taken a real passion. So not only are we benefiting from that, but uh, the whole Southeast Portland benefits from this guy. He's doing presentations all the time and he's he's uh, licensed for ham radio. He's setting up a mesh network. So when the big one arrives and the grid is down and communications are down and roadways are down and sewers are down for a while. Uh, we can set up a, uh, a system where we'll have communications, we'll have our own sanitation, uh, we'll have, you know, water, 30 days of water for each resident here. Uh, but yeah, we have many people who are giving to the greater community. He's, a, he's really a model of that. Yeah, another another item I've asked you before, um, and you you mentioned something uh, during the you were you were talking about Annapurna. Is your son is his name Caleb? Caleb, yes, Caleb is our Caleb. son in law. Caleb, yeah. <laughs> what I had asked you before, and it seems like maybe Caleb is kind of already already has some of the skills or whether he has the interest, who knows? But what I've asked you before is, and of course you said, no, I, I'm not going to be doing that. But uh, as you mentioned, there must be thousands and thousands and thousands of apartment complexes all over the country that could stand an upgrade, whether they're as run down as uh, Annapurna or Kyle Ash, maybe, maybe not. But you know the trends that we experience, uh, the 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 politics, the environment, uh, climate change, circumstances are going to be changing, and they already are. And I'm wondering about a convergence of trends of needing to downsize, uh, needing to live more in a cooperative community, and all these apartment complexes that people don't even know who's next door. Is Caleb or or somebody going to tune into that and and make a successful socially responsible business out of transforming apartment complexes into eco villages? Yeah, yeah. Well, Caleb is fully occupied here at Kailash and Annapurna. I mean, he's got a hand. He's got his hands full with the, these two projects. I mean, now the between the two of us, we're like eighty some units. Uh, and we still have a fair amount to do at uh, Annapurna. So oh, I know. We're just well, could, could he mentor somebody? Could he mentor oh, yeah. somebody? So, you know, uh, that might be a full-time job in its own. We do have people contacting us all, all the time, particularly when we get a lot of uh, press. So, for example, when Kirsten Dirksen put out her video on faircompanies.org, I don't know if you saw that video. It was called Agritopia. Um, uh, anyway, he, she, she has millions of followers. We have close to a couple million views on that. 
uh, when that first came out a couple of years ago, we had a lot of people who were inspired by the project, the idea of this project, and contacted us for ideas on how they could do something. They wanted to do a project like that on their own. Or maybe they were uh, already running a, a an apartment or landlord business like that, and they wanted to take it to the next level. So what we've tried to do, we don't have time to individually uh, walk people through the process. What we try to do is on our web page, document what we're doing, our mission, our approach, um, plus uh, many of the projects that we've created here, the, you know, the tree house and the rainwater and the artistic projects and uh, and other sorts of things that are going on uh, to serve as uh, a model that other people can pick and choose the characteristics that, that they are attracted to and try and incorporate similar ideas into their own projects. So we spent a lot of time. We have a really great, one of our residents here manages our webpage and he is a really fantastic artist and uh, communicator and has formatted our stuff really, really nicely. So uh, we share our projects in a, you know, a really nice fashion. Uh, so that's allowed us to kind of mentor people informally. Uh -huh, sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, just so many good stories. I, I didn't really know quite so much. Uh, I knew you did have that kind of useful how-to information on your website, but I didn't know that much about it. So you don't need to personally hold somebody's hand, but you have information there that could be really helpful, like you said, for people to pick and choose what you've done, and then they can apply that to what they're doing. And hopefully they even do some, uh, some innovation and inventing on their own that they can pass on to other people. Yeah, yeah, we look forward to hearing about other people's projects because uh, we might be inspired by something we had never thought of. Sure. And one thing I want to emphasize here is, you know, there are a lot of armchair permaculturists and armchair dreamers dreaming of how the world could be different. But the important thing is to roll up your sleeves and start projects how, wherever it is that you're at, you can start a project right there and then use that to bootstrap you to the next level uh, and keep going again and again, iteration, one iteration after another, uh, gradually expanding your capabilities. Uh, so uh, you know that that's really an, an important aspect is you got to get your hands dirty. Uh, don't just sit pipe dreaming in your armchair get busy. Uh, you're going to stumble. Of course, there are going to be bumps in the road, uh, but you'll learn from them and you'll be creating the next uh, utopia. You know, it may not be like ours, but it may have, you know, for a, a different audience, maybe you're uh, for a, an artistic endeavor instead of somebody focused on gardening. Our, one of our focuses, is, our main focus is, is food production. Maybe you're not interested in doing that. Maybe you're more interested in communal art projects or something like that. Uh, so you, you can take this same mind frame and move in many, many different directions, rehabilitating uh, vanilla and uh, uninspired projects take them to the next level uh, and improve the world and make it a better place. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you've really added a lot. I've, I've seen Ole's presentations with slides and they're really, really good. But this conversation to get a little bit more of the background uh, has filled in a lot more. I, I feel a lot more aware of, um, of what you've been doing there and, and kind of your own uh, uh, sort of emotional and personal approach to what you're doing. I really appreciate that, Ole. Well, thank you. Thank you. And, I, you know, I hope people can get a take away from this uh, that they can start the next great project. You just got to start where you're at and apply yourself uh, get some inspiration from other projects, see how you might work things out. Uh, but 
uh, you know, the future is yours to create. Yeah, I think it's really important to emphasize you have uh, have made a, a wonderful adventure, you and Maitre there, with uh, restoring, repairing a couple of apartment complexes. People can do this in their own homes, uh, in their own neighborhoods. It's not necessarily just apartment complexes we're talking about. We're talking about it could be rural, could be urban, could be suburban. Practically anywhere offers itself to upgrade the vibe, you know, to upgrade the spirit and, and make almost any place an example of how our society could be. Ab absolutely. So if you're living in your own uh, single family residential area, you can become an inspiration for your neighbors by you know creating a beautiful place with flowers and whatever it is that will that could inspire you and the neighbors but yes wherever you're at uh move to to a brighter area uh move to a more inspiring area uh by creating your re a new reality where you're at where you're at yeah yeah we we can be pioneers this this is a situation of, of new pioneers. So any any final thoughts, Ole? I think I've covered most of what you mentioned, uh, that you gave me some kind of cheat uh, phrases here. Motivation, the loan, the repairs, planning versus evolving social life. I think I've touched on most, oh, most of these. You have. Yeah. Been, yeah. been yeah. so good. Been so good. Well, I really appreciate that, and I would certainly hope that that people who watch this video will will take something home from it. And as you say, the world we would prefer to see isn't going to happen by itself, and uh, there's just unlimited opportunities. No matter what person a, a person's condition or situation is, doesn't take a million dollars to be a positive difference. You don't even have to be a property owner to make a positive difference. So true, so absolutely true. Okay, Ole, that's good. I think I'm gonna stop our uh, recording right now. And um, once again, I'm Jan Spencer here in Eugene, and we've been talking with Ole Erson in Portland, Oregon. So thanks for watching.